this is there as well. And, and that is part of our human condition. So I hope uh, this much is clear that we all have a spiritual dimension. In addition to the physical dimension, we have an internal spiritual dimension. So when we talk about the spiritual crisis of the modern man, I hope this much is clear what we are talking about. A crisis, I'll, I'll get into it, and modern man I'll also, uh, I have to define that. But is it clear that what, I, what is meant by the spiritual is that dimension of our being that opens up to the divine, to the relationship with the creator, whether we deny it or not, whether we have a strong relationship or not, that's the secondary question and we'll, we'll deal with, with some aspect of that. So when we say crisis now, this is the uh, second key term, crisis means something that is abnormal, that is not normal. So when we say that uh, uh, if we go to the beach by an ocean and we see the waves coming in, the ebb and flow of the waves, every day it happens, morning and evening. The waves come, the water comes, and it recedes. That's the normal course, even though the waves are huge, but they will come and go. But if we have a tusami, that is abnormal. Then we have a crisis of the water situation that wasn't there, that is supposed not to be there, or we assume that it is supposed not to, not to be there. So crisis is a situation where the, where the uh, the situation is not normal anymore. And by normal, of course, we mean what we expect it to be. A crisis is, a, uh, is, is something that is not normal. Like we are all supposedly being held down by gravity, sitting here on the chairs. Now suppose you suddenly start to float up. The gravity leaves you and you are halfway in the, in the room. Would we call it crisis? It will be an abnormal situation. We did not expect that to happen. Because we understand whether we recognize the force of gravity or not, we recognize that normally human beings are able to sit down and have their feet on the ground. So crisis uh, is something that is not normal. And Mike, uh, the focus of this, these three days and this focus of this uh, series of lectures is on the spiritual crisis of the modern man, which means that our spiritual relationships have become abnormal. They are not normal anymore. Now, modern man is the last, and of course, man here uh, is used with the capital M, and uh, some feminists uh, may object to that, uh, but it is just by, you know, for the sake of simplicity, instead of saying man, woman all the time, we are talking about human beings. We are talking about human race in general. And by modern, uh, I take uh, the post-Renaissance period to be the modern period. Again, this is a definition that is totally arbitrary. There is, I, and I'm not going to insist on it because there are so many definitions out there. However, for our purpose, uh, this is the period that we are talking about. Now, why so? Why are we talking about the post-Renaissance period to be the modern period? Uh, just to understand what we have gone through, at least in the Western world, uh, during the time that we are talking about. These are the major, I'm not going to read through the list here, but these are the major trends of thought. These are the major revolutions which have taken place at least in the Western world, and through that, uh, they have affected every single human being now living on this planet, except for some very remote uh, desert people where uh, modernity hasn't reached yet. But everything is under the impact of this modernity, uh, primarily because of the reach of the technology, primarily because now we have the ability to go to a desert and set up our satellite dishes and affect that place in a way that has never been done for hundreds of years prior to the existence, prior to the coming into existence of the modern times. Uh, these are both constructive and uh, destructive currents and uh, forces which have unleashed themselves on humanity during the last 400 years. 
starting, uh, especially starting with the scientific revolution of the 17th century. You will notice that there is an abundance of three letters uh, in modern thought. I, S, M, ism. This is an amazing word, ism. Have you ever reflected where does it come from? Why do we have so many isms? Humanism, naturalism, nationalism, rationalism, deism, idealism. Why do we have, where does this come from? What is the, what is the root, what is the foundation of the emergence of isms? We never had this before. Like before the, before this modernity, before the, uh, before the time of Renaissance, there was no such thing as isms. Why do we have isms now? What does it mean? It is related to, fundamentally related to the topic at hand. This is the destruction, this is the process of the crisis, of the destruction of the spiritual aspect of the human race with the connection that we have with the Creator. So the crisis that we want to reflect on, and this is, please don't fall asleep now, this is the time that we really need to probe into our own beings and see if we have this crisis within ourselves or not. And I'm going to make a very grand statement here. Please bear with me. We are all sick. We are all sick. We, human beings, now living at this time, we are all sick with this, this disease of the spirit, spirit. Our spirits are sick. Our bodies may be walking, talking, and being looking healthy. But the spirit that we actually, the spirit that controls us, it has been deeply affected by the very air it breathes. Not the air and, uh, that the bodies are breathing, but the spiritual ambience of the modern times is such that we have a severance of that most fundamental relationship that we are supposed to have with the Creator. And the nature of that severance, that deprivation, varies from human being to human being. This is the verse I was talking about before that exists about the people who, who were called the Hriyun, the people who just said that it's only time that changes. This has never, never been in the history of human, humanity. There has never been a time before the modern time when there were so many people who openly said, oh, I don't know if there is a God or not. They existed before but as an isolated, a small segment of humanity. But out of seven billion people now, a very large number is absolutely denying. So this is the spectrum. On the one side, we have those who say, who call themselves atheists. And the other, other aspect, we have what I call, for, a, for the lack of a better term, lost believers. Now, whether these believers are Muslims or Jewish or Christians, or uh, you know, that doesn't matter. But the lost believers, meaning people who do believe in the existence of a creator, who do have a relationship with the Creator, but that relationship has been deformed. It has become sick. It is not a healthy relation anymore. In the sense that the, the currents of modernity have attacked, just like our bodies are attacked by, by different kinds of diseases, various diseases have crept into that relationship with the divine, and the irony of that situation is that many people are not even aware that they are sick. Many people are not even aware that they are sick in their spirit, let alone uh, try to, to cure it. And, and, I, and, and the, the grand statement I, I mentioned is not to provoke you, but uh, as, a, as a matter of fact. So we have a spectrum of, uh, of these diseases. And now I want to point, pinpoint, and we can start recognizing various aspects of this spiritual crisis that we all have. 
this is obviously something not uh, being reinvented by myself. Lots of people, lots of thinkers have reflected on uh, on the nature of this crisis that we that has been called the spiritual crisis for the lack of any proper better term for this lecture series. One of these uh, persons, um, Hassan, Muhammad Hassan Askri, who died in 1978, he actually put together in point form um, what he called Gumrahi's modern aberrations. The first thing to note, as I already mentioned, that in the previous times, uh, this crisis was <coughs> limited. Now it is global. Now, this second aspect is that certain key religious terms have changed so many times that they have even lost meaning. <coughs> so understanding of the primary concepts has become problematic. What I understand from something, you understand it differently. The third person understands it differently. Religion and fitra, for example, are the two prime examples of this kind of distortion. What is meant by religion? What is meant by religion? Or how the term religion is understood in the modern times by itself, that has become problematic. Different people understand it differently. And they are so fundamentally different from each other that there is no common denominator left anymore. So I have listed some of these uh, aspects of the, of the diseases. Religion in Arabic deen uh, has three distinct elements. Aqaid, that is what we believe, acts of worship, ibadah, and ethics. One of the diseases of the modern times is not to recognize these three integral units of deen in their own right, but to mix them up or either take one or two as if they, they can be separated. Now, beliefs are fundamental. Beliefs don't evolve. They don't change. By that I mean either somebody believes in the Creator or somebody does not believe in the Creator. That understanding of the Creator develops, changes, improves or decreases. Our relationship increases or decreases, but the fundamental aspect of the belief does not evolve. It's not an evolutionary process. The third aberration is about the ibadat. Now, there is a very fundamental aspect of uh, epistemy of knowledge. How do we, how do we know how we, what we know? How do we know what we know? To make it more concrete, Muslims. Uh, have a furth, have an, have an obligation to pray five times the salaf, five salawat in a day. Why five? Why not four? Why not three? Why not two? Why not seven or ten? Right? This piece of knowledge, this piece of knowledge is something that has come from beyond the human plane. It is ordained. So ibadat, the acts of worship, uh, they are not mere rituals which can be accepted, rejected, or modified. It is something given to us from beyond the human plane. One of the modern aberrations is to take them as uh, something which can be chained. Other aspects 
are mentioned here, I will not go into, into detail of every single one, but uh, uh, the evolutionary aspect is something that we need to be aware of. Uh, we believe that uh, fundamental truths are also evolutionary. I, I don't mean we believe them, but it's one of the crises, one of the aspects of the crisis, that because of the general aspect of evolutionary theory, applicable to all fields of knowledge. It has become fashionable, it has become common place to consider that uh, beliefs are also evolutionary. There is, number seven is very fundamental and you see it everywhere. In the name of uh, tolerance, equality, or other such grand sounding ways, uh, what is truth and what is false, what is haq and what is batil, uh, have been put on the same level, at par with each other. Each one is considered to be as valid as the other one. This is very fundamental. You see it everywhere. You know, uh, uh, th there is no, no external criteria, they say, upon which one can verify the truth claim of one statement as opposed to another statement. Number eight is also very important. I mentioned something of the, uh, about the akal before, which is now equated with reason. One aspect of the reason being the fundamental crisis in terms of the spiritual understanding of who we are is that anything that does not fit within our rational framework, and miracles are one of those, uh, we deny them. There are translations of the Quran, for example, many translations existing now, in which the supra-rational is rationalized in a way that fits within the human frame of the norm, of the, reason, of the reasoned out systematic process, uh, in which the divine intervention, which we call miracle, and what is a miracle? Miracle is something that at a certain level it abrogates the norm at a certain level. Uh, there are many miracles mentioned in the, in the Quran as well as in the Bible. Number 10, and this is very common in the, especially in the Muslim world among the, uh, among the believers. Uh, the authority, where, is, where does the authority lie? The modern spiritual crisis uh, stems in a very large way from the fact that everyone now demands a written text as an authority. There is a very large scale project going on now to reconstruct the Quran, for example, in Germany, on the basis of written text found in a cave. Now, uh, this, is, this is the modern, modern cult of the written text gaining authority and supremacy over the oral tradition. In, uh, at least in Islam, the oral takes precedent over the written. Ikra was the first word with which the revelation started. Recite. If someone to write down on a piece of paper the two testimonies of faith, Ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, sign it up and, do no, and not pronounce with the tongue and not believe in the heart, that would not make that person a Muslim. 
we take knowledge from the spoken word, not from the written text. And that applies to the Quran, that applies to the Hadith. We believe, in, if you, you saw the previous Hadith uh, cited here, so and so, I heard from so and so who said that I heard from so and so who said that I was there when so and so said this. Right? Every single hadith that we have, the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, goes back to a living being, starting from the person who actually is the last in the chain, going back step by step to the Prophet ﷺ. Likewise, in the, in the, the text of the Quran that we have, uh, anybody can print anything. That doesn't matter. It's the oral text that is the testimony to the written text. And this thing plays out in social life, in inheritance, in all kinds of other ways. In the olden times, the grandfather or the great-grandfather said, you see this piece of land that I have, I divide it between you, son, my son, you get this, you get this, you get this, and it was done. It was finished. There was no sign, there was nothing, nothing done. And this is one of the problems in, the, in, the, in, the, in Palestine right now. When, when they established the state, they said to the Palestinians, oh, where is your piece of paper that you own this land? Oh, I don't have it. My grandfather said this is yours and it's mine. Right? In, 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 uh, in the marriages, the nikah, like all those things, they were all established on the basis of the oral. That means the tongue... Not the hand, but the tongue which, which makes the sounds, which makes the words, which speaks, had a respect. It had an inherent superiority over the written, written text. And, and, and modernity, they say, oh, you know why? Because they didn't have paper. We have computers. We, we can generate tremendous amount of paper. No, that wasn't the reason. That wasn't the reason. So the authenticity goes back to the, to the oral text. We also have, a, there are several other things, but um, uh, when we go into, into categorizing the diseases of the spirit, then inshallah we'll go, go back to it. In addition to this individual aspect of the crisis, we also have a collective crisis. And by that I mean Everyone living today is conscious of something extremely fundamental having gone wrong. There is a general understanding, general awareness of, uh, of a great calamity just being around the corner. This is something that actually has existed for hundreds of years that somehow the order of existence is not going to be sustained for a long time. This expectation of the end, it was greatly enhanced by the coming of Isa alayhi salam. And those who believe, uh, who are practicing Christians, they will recall that uh, the expectation with which the end, the coming of the Messiah, uh, was expected by the people who actually saw Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, upon him peace. And they felt that the whole order of the universe is going to crumble very soon. A similar expectation was there after uh, the Prophet Islam. The companions they expected the end to come very soon. Century after century, this expectation of the end, the grand end, not the small accidents here and there, but the total uh, culmination of the period has been there. That expectation changed with the Renaissance period. This is very fundamental to understanding the spiritual crisis because it 
has a temporal manifestation. The expectation that the whole universe, the whole cosmos actually, everything is going to come to an end, was carried on century after century after century until we come to the scientific revolution when that expectation, consciously, dis conscious expectation disappeared or started to disappear. And there is a very strange irony in that, that the, although from the general human consciousness, the expectation started to erode, but the whole order of existence, as if in Martin Ling's world, uh, the, it, was built, it was born out of a finality. So the consciousness of the coming of the end started to disappear, but the, that consciousness transferred into the air, so that everyone now living, everyone now living, has this built-in fear: something great is going to happen, whether there is going to be an atomic war, or some other great calamity, that, or whether it's the environmental collapse the ozone layer is going to disappear, something is going to happen that will make life impossible on earth. So there is a temporal manifestation of the order of existence, which is related to the serial time. I am quoting uh, this khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ that he delivered on the 9th of Zil Hijjah in the only Hajj that he performed a year before his demise. This was the greatest and the largest gathering of the companions of the Prophet in the, mount, in, in the, in the plain of Arafah, where now two million people gather every year. One of the things he said, he asked, he asked people, what day is this? What month is this? What city is this? This is a very beautiful uh, and very concise temporal dimension of the flow of time, born into which is a change in the nature of time, because at the end of this khutbah, he said that the time itself has come full circle today. Time itself has come a full circle today. So when we when we when we discuss the the linear time, we understand that it progresses day after day, moment after moment, second after second. Today is according to one calendar, second of January two thousand and twelve. If we measure it from another calendar, it would be fourteen thirty three Hijra the month of Safar. These are all arbitrary scales on which we measure the time. According to the Jewish calendar, it would be 5,000 some year. According to the Iranian calendar, it would be a different date. What we do know is that there is a serial progression in time. But the flow of time is not uniform. The flow of time is not uniform. Time unrolls, unfurls at an uneven pace. So there is this contraction. We are all aware, we are all aware that time is very short. Everyone feels that there isn't enough time in a day to do all the things that we want to do. Although it's the same 24-hour period that we all have as, say, 2,000 years ago, it was the same 24-hour period, from one sunrise to the next sunrise. But why was there so much time in people's lives at that time? And now everyone is rushed. Time is 